I was living in a nightmare come true. My older boy, Andy, was locked in the juvenile psycho ward at Bellevue because he had been deemed a danger to himself and others. He had dislodged the bathroom sink in a sudden and unexplainable rage and thrown a heavy glass ashtray out the window, just missing the head of a maintenance man sweeping the sidewalk. I felt as unhinged as that sink Andy had pulled from the wall. I had to be back on Sesame Street in the morning, delivering the mail to Oscar the Grouch and Big Bird and those bright-eyed children who would sit on my lap. They were so adorable and precious, and I was in such pain. I couldn't sleep, and I didn't think I could do another scene with those beautiful children. I tried to talk to myself into it. Come on, Charlotte, you're an actress. You can love them and admire them and marvel at them. In truth, I envied them and their parents for being normal and seeming happy. I didn't know anymore if Annie would ever be happy or what would become of him. All night to numb my pain and catch a few winks of sleep, I drank four roses or vodka and swallowed the occasional milk hound. Somehow I slept and in the morning somehow I walk, woke up and somehow got through the morning on Sesame Street. I never drank before or during work, but probably smelled at least a little of it from the night before. I didn't want to be there. It was an honor to be part of that wonderful cast and the noble mission of the show. But my son needed me, and I was beginning to think I should step away from acting altogether. As soon as the director said the words, that's a wrap for today, I was through the exit, rushing across town to visit Andy. It was his 16th birthday, so I stopped at a grocery store to buy a cake and his favorite cranapple juice. I carried it all down First Avenue and up to PQ5, Bellevue's juvenile ward. I saw Andy inside that place through the glass window of a locked door. His hands clutched his ears. A mob of teenagers formed, teenagers formed around him. They were raging mad at Andy, and he cowered from them, hitting and scratching and biting himself. I rang the doorbell and pounded on the metal door. I was terrified. Finally, someone opened it up, and I rushed inside. The cranapple juice slipped out of my hands and smashed on the floor. I stood in the puddle of reddish liquid and chips of broken glass. I was beside myself. I felt defeated, humiliated, and still terrified for Andy. The exploding bottle distracted the boys who had been attacking Andy, but they were still surrounding him, and now he was even more agitated. Please don't hurt my son, I pleaded, and burst into tears. They looked at me, and one of them said, Hey, I know you. You was on car 54, where are you? Sure, Sylvia Schnauzer. Car 54, where are you? He sang, and some of the others laughed. <laughs> they kept laughing, and I kept crying. What's the matter, Sylvia? One asked. My son, I said, and that I got to Andy and hugged him. He trembled in my arms. Oh, we ain't gonna hurt him. We just mad because he broke the TV set. He didn't mean it, I said, and a few of the boys got down on the floor to pick up the shards of broken glass. A staff member showed up with a mop, but then stood there watching the boys pick out pieces of glass. I knelt down with them to pick up the broken glass. To me, these teenage boys look so normal, so cognizant, not like Andy. We cleaned the floor, and then I put candles on Andy's birthday cake. A staff member lit them with his bic, 
and we all sang happy birthday, and everyone helped Andy blow out his candles. And as we shared the pieces of cake, I told these boys, you have a chance in life. We don't know how much of a chance Andy has. We're hoping, but we just don't know. It was the first time I'd ever said that to anyone. Maybe it was the first time I'd allowed myself to think it. It wasn't easy. Pull yourself together, I told these young men. I suppose I had no business saying it. What did I know about why they were locked up at Bellevue? Only that they seemed so much more capable than my sons. So I told them, get it together and get out of here and move on to a better life. You have a chance. I hugged my son again, and then each of the other boys came to me for a hug, and I hugged them all, too. The young men nodded their heads. A few made pledges to me about their futures. One said he was going to be president one day. After that night, they were kind to Andy and even protected him from other residents until my husband John and I were able to get him out of there. I have often thought of those boys and how nice they were to me that afternoon and to Andy after that. I hope they did get themselves out of PQ5. I hope they accomplished things and found love in their lives and peace, beauty, and meaning beyond the walls of an institution. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Charlotte's son and co-author, <laughs> a writer and teacher of high school English in South Central Los Angeles, Larry Strauss. Yes. Hi, welcome. Um, well, it's always interesting <coughs> doing Q&A with your mother. Uh, <laughs> it's very interesting writing a book with, with, uh, with your mother. What... Um, I guess my first question is, this is you're 89 years old, almost 90. Yeah, 90. I'll be 90, God willing, and the grace of God. In a couple weeks. April 22nd, which is Earth Day. <laughs> and, and what's this experience been like for you, um, writing a book and, you know, well, reading your book. Well, I never, I never really thought of doing a memoir because I'm not a writer. I'm an actor. But you're a writer, and you said, Ma, you said, it, you're 87 and a half. It's about time we wrote your memoirs. And so because of you, we did it. And you did a, a, a beautiful job. It sounds like I'm talking. Well... Yeah, I should add that um, you really approached it as the way that you've always approached your art, which was it was very interesting to me as a writer. You know, writing is this quiet activity with words and struggling over them, and um, and what what would happen is I would we would talk and then I would write a chapter, and then um, you would perform it in the kitchen in front of me. <laughs> as if it was a monologue, and you would m make notes on it the way you would a script, the way you used to, you know, I remember sometimes I would drive, when I would drive you to work, when you were doing the Facts of Life, and you'd be scratching up the script and saying this doesn't work and this is good, and you would b basically doing the same thing with, uh, with that and really owned it. Mm -hmm. and, and then even after you thought it was right, you would still read it as though you needed to, you know, perfect your performance on it. So I think in that respect, the book really is like you're a performance. Or Keep your microphone to the mouth. Okay, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> um, well, I guess since I'm being blamed for this book, um, I should explain what kind of drove me to think that it was worthwhile. Um, you know, I, I grew up... Uh, sort of seeing many different sides of you. I mean, the, 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 the very famous part didn't happen until I was already grown. But 
but you know, I remember just the contrast between the public life and the private life, and also the contrast between you know, you as the star of a sitcom and as a serious actress, which I, I know is something that was always very important to you. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, t talk a little bit about how that, you know, that drive and how that came to be, that you wanted to be an actress and what kind of actress you wanted to be. Well, I'll tell you, in this book, I got to tell you, I, I let it all hang out. I tell you all about, well, I turned to uh, uh, alcoholism until uh, one point because I was so stressed out about uh, my older boy, Andy, God bless him, and, uh, and, and everything. And uh, for a long time, I, I thought I was going to drop the career because I wanted to do everything, everything, everything. And my husband and I, we did try to do everything, everything, everything. And, and he, we had good times with him, and, and then there were tough times with him. But it was not only autism. It was uh, he also had childhood schizophrenia, and he had, uh, what do you call those uh, things when they... Epile epilepsy. He had epilepsy, and... Uh, and and he was he had retardation, but we had some adorable times with him, as well as the 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 tough times, and we loved him very much. He he passed, he passed at the age of forty five. Uh, but I mean, um, where did I where I'm wandering? Where am I? That's okay. <laughs> well, actually, I what um talk though about the just the, the Northwestern days and just the, you know, what you, how you envision your, your career, you know, what your goals were. Oh, well, I was artist. one of three sisters, and, um, and I got to tell you, I owe everything to my mother and father. They really never made me feel that I had to go to secretary school. I mean, they were not rich, but they were, uh, my father was an immigrant, from Russia, and uh, I'm of the uh, uh, I'm I'm a Jewish girl, and but uh, um, they they wanted the th uh, I'm one of three sisters, and we were all very talented. My older sister turned out to be a brilliant singer and became an opera singer, and my younger sister became a, a great musician and a composer and a pianist and. They opened up the whole world to us about music and art because they had never had these things themselves. So I owe so much to them. And they sent me to Northwestern University, which was like $250 a quarter. In those days, that was a lot of money. And uh, Cloris Leachman was there at the time, and Paul Lind, and uh, Patricia Neal, and all sorts of marvelous, talented people. And that's where I really started. Look, we all learned how to drink there, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to go, you actually had to go to leave school and go to. What? The, um, Northwestern is in Evanston, and that uh, was a dry town, right? Yeah, and right at the, uh, the borderline to Chicago was Howard Street. And we'd all hot foot it over there whenever we could and have, um, what do we call, I forget what they called it, but we'd, we'd have a, um, a shot of whiskey. Why am I talking about drinking? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous because I've been a member of- Because that's all you guys did Because school. I've been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for 42 years. <laughs> and I want everybody to know because I, I think it's everyone should tell everybody because it might help somebody else to join because it's so wonderful. <laughs> anyway, uh, where are we? <laughs> um, well, after Northwestern, you, uh, you went to New York, and you're actually roommates with one of your college friends, right? Uh, yeah, I roommate with Cloris Leachman, 
Yes. And uh, yes, Clarence. <laughs> and and uh, I, I should just say, I should say that um, not every, you, you know, you, you said you let it all hang out. There was a lot of, there were a lot of things that she told me that were not all that flattering about other people. Um, and, uh, but you insisted on not putting those in. That's right. So she didn't let everything hang out. She protected <laughs> other people. Yeah. And uh, there were some very interesting times with Cloris. Some <laughs> of them made it into the book. Some of them did not. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll see. <laughs> no, what else? And then, uh, and then Paul was also in New York oh, at the time. Oh, Paul Lynn and I played opposite each other at Northwestern in all the comedy sketches. And we used to slug drinks together at Hot Howard Street and, uh, and and came to New York together and you know how funny he was remember on Hollywood Square is well a lot of you are too young to remember <laughs> yeah and um, no Northwestern was wonderful but I was interested in being a serious actress I didn't want to do a comedy but uh, Paul Lynn encouraged me to try out for the musical. So I tried out and I, I did the scenes absolutely truthfully and not to be funny. And I, I got all of the, I won all the, the, all the big part with all the sketches. And I think it's because <coughs> when you try to be funny, it's not funny. But if you are really real and if the writing is good, it, it, it's funny. So then I found out that I could do that, and I, I could sing. And then Sheldon Harnett, should I tell him about Sheldon? Yeah, sure. Oh, Sheldon Harnett. Um, he wrote Fiddler on the Roof. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> well, he, you know, I, I, I was instrumental in helping him uh, come to New York. He, he was in the music school, and he wrote a number which I did in the musical, it was towards the end of the war where I was um, Rosie the Riveter, and I sang this song he wrote uh, about, I got the, the gotta go home alone tonight blues, and I wore overalls and everything. And, and he was very clever. And uh, I, I went to New York, and I, I, I was going, I was singing in places where I could showcase myself for Broadway, that's what we all wanted to be on Broadway. And um, I kept saying, Sheldon, most of the things on Broadway aren't as good as the way you write. Why don't you come to New York? And he said, no, I'll stay in uh, Chicago. And then finally I saw Finian's Rainbow. And it was so wonderful. I sent him the album and I said, you're made of the same stuff. Come, please come to New York. He listened to the album and he said, that's what I want to do with my life. And he came to New York. And right now, he's 92. April 30th, he'll be 92. <coughs> and they, they just opened Fiddler on the Roof again. And they just opened She Loves Me. His both, and they're both big hits again on Broadway. So that's wonderful. And I, I feel kind of thrilled because I was his kind of channel getting him going. And he never forgets that. He always no. gives you credit. No. Uh, when You also did live television when oh. you got to New York. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what was that like? I know you had one near mishap. Yeah. I was pregnant and I was doing a show and um, we rehearsed it over and over and over and over again. And when the taping came, I was so tired. All I wanted to do, was whenever I saw a bed, I wanted to lie down. And um, I got to um, this scene, and I thought it was the last scene. And I said goodbye to everyone. They wished me good luck with the pregnancy. And Joe Pat, who was the uh, incredible producer of uh, Shakespeare in the Park and the Public Theater, 
he was an AD guy then. And I hugged him and kissed him and said goodbye. And I went off and hailed a cab. He came out. He came out. He said, there's no water here. Okay. Is there water? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll and he came water. out and said, no, you have one more scene. So they threw me, I mean, I felt so sorry for Sheila Bond. She looked in closets and in drawers. She was <laughs> Finally, they threw me together and I finished it. But I mean, oh, I remember, uh, you don't know these people, but Beatrice Lilly and Reginald Gardner. How do you know they don't know them? We're doing a scene. Oh, I, oh all right, some people know. <laughs> <laughs> and they were doing a scene on Ed Sullivan. And I was watching. And uh, Reginald Gardner went behind the screen to change an outfit and came back and continued with the uh, Lily. And all of a sudden, his fly was open. And the next thing I knew, it was live television. I saw an arm go in and zip it up. <laughs> Wait a minute. Ah. <coughs> Uh, I think it's time for uh, some questions from you guys. Anybody? If you have questions, please come on up front here, and we'll take your questions. Question for Charlotte or for Larry? All right. Hi. Your name and your question. My name is Michelle. And Hi, Michelle. I, I, I don't know if, if, if I'm going to take the question, but we love you as Mrs. Garrett. We want to thank you for, for being in television and being a part of our lives and in our family. For so many years, that's how I remember you, and I'm, I'm so excited to see you today. You're a beautiful lady, inside and out, and thank you so much for coming. Not, it's not a question, but I just wanted to say thank you. Oh. You're, you're a beautiful lady. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. And you are too. Thank you. Look at the <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Come on over. Hi. Can you talk about what it was like to be in New York at that time with that many people who were that talented who were all going to be successful? I mean, because you were with big-name people, but you guys didn't know you were big names then. Yeah, well, I, 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 I felt I was desperate, desperate to do it. I really, I, well, first of all. You almost left school early, didn't you? Huh? You almost left school early. Oh, well, I, I almost left school early, but my, my father said, please, and my mother, finish your education. <laughs> right, but you went to, you actually went to New York before, was it th right before your senior year of college? Yeah, and Patricia what? Patricia Neal, and, yeah, no, and you were. Uh, oh, yeah, I saw, well, to see Patricia Neal and Gene Hagen, and we had such a good time together. Oh, it was one I, I was so in love with New York. And we saw Annie Get Your Gun with uh, Ethel Merman. We went to Sardi's afterwards. And oh my God, I was so excited. But I came to New York and uh, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I got a job in a, um, an office typing and filing. And then um, I auditioned for a, a job on 46th Street. Uh, it was called the Sawdust Trail. And um, I got up on the bar and sang. And, um, and the other performer was, what's her name? Oh, I know it so well. Uh, the one who sings, put the nickel, nickel in. In the Nickelodeon, all you hear is music, music, music. Teresa Brewer? Teresa Brewer. Teresa was 16 and Fries I was. for the. Teresa was, thank you. Teresa was 22, uh, 16 and I was 22. And we had a dressing room upstairs and we didn't have to mix with the customers and, and drink whiskey, which was good. And, uh, and, um, there was sawdust on the floor and vaudevillian waiters who sang. And uh, my sister, my older sister, said, oh, it's very evil in New York. You better take her home. So my daddy came 
to check me out. And uh, he came uh, to Sawdust Trail, and he was at the bar. I was running in to go put on my gown. There he was with tears in his eyes at the bar. And he told me later that the cigarette girl had hustled him. <laughs> anyway, um, the next day, he came to see my uh, apartment and see that everything was okay. And while we were talking in my little apartment on 68th Street between uh, Broadway and Amsterdam, he, um, the landlord came up. He saw that I had an older man in the apartment. And, he, and so when my father left, and we knocked on the door after my father left and said, oh, Miss Ray, I was just wondering if sometimes we couldn't have cocktails. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> anyway, it was a wonderful chance to showcase uh, yourself for Broadway by and make a buck. I really didn't think I could make a living any other way. I really didn't. So I would do the typing and the filing in the daytime, and then at night I would go to the sawdust trail. And they'd come in off the street. <laughs> Sometimes they'd put a, I'd say, he can come home as late as can be. And someone would hand me a quarter. I'd say, thank you. La da 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 da. -da. <laughs> Great. We have some more questions. You may amend your question. Um, Jennifer, um, it's an honor to meet you, Charlotte. Um, Back to Life was pretty much my favorite show growing up, and I still watch it. My husband <laughs> watches it. <again. laughs> um, I was just wondering, what was it like moving out to LA? I mean, you got Back to Life, and it gets different strokes, and I mean, that was like a complete transition from being on Broadway in New York, and then. It was filmed in L.A., right, I think, right? Huh? And that was like a whole lifestyle change for you. Yeah. What was that like? Well, it was... Um, well, you moved, you moved before any of that happened, right? You guys moved without a job. Yeah, we... we my, my husband, John, wonderful musician, composer, and became... And you, you'll find out in the book. You got to get the book. <laughs> because in it, we, we meet Nat Hyken, um, who did the Martha Ray show, and uh, eventually did the Phil Silver show, You'll Never Get Rich, and then Car 54. Car 54, Where Are You? And, and someone told him that we were cousins. And I think one of my cousins married one of his cousins, and he was the writer producer. A wonderful, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. And so he asked John, because we became friends, if he would uh, do the music to uh, the Phil Silver Show and Car 54, Where Are You? And, I mean, he was amazing. My husband did it and learned how to sound at it on the job because he, he, he'd never done it before in his life. He had studied with Hindemith at uh, Yale yeah. after he came back from the war. Anyway, to get back, I'm wandering. Um, what brought you to L.A.? Well, my John wanted to go, my husband. He said, when he came to see me in it, I was, I did a, a small part. I was asked to come to do Time of the Cuckoo with Gene Stapleton, who is the, was the sweetest, the dearest lady in the world, at, at Jean Stapleton. At the uh, Amundsen Theater, right? Yes. And, um, and I played a little part. Little, uh, I played Mrs. McElhenney. And, uh, and it was spring break. So Larry and uh, John came, and John fell in love with it. You know, it's very seductive, the weather and the ocean and everything. And he says, well, let's move here. It's, 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 I'd rather work and do sound editing here than in New York. And so we decided to do it without a job. 
this was really weird. And we took a chance, and he couldn't get arrested. Yeah, it you guys were really, and you guys were like really New Yorkers out here. You both like got these ridiculous cars. I remember you had, we had Ford Pintos when we first got here. And one morning you were driving me to school and we got rear-ended. It, it must have been four miles an hour because at five miles an hour, you know, they, they blew up the Ford Pinto. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question. Thank you. Hi, your name and your question. Hi, my name is Pinky, and I was wondering if you had a favorite episode of Facts of Life. Oh, I don't know. I, I just love those girls. And I love the directors, and I don't know. The favorite, oh, favorite, 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 favorite. Well, I, I remember uh, I really worked hard on the one about suicide. Uh, I really worked hard, and I told him that there should be a hotline with young people, like the, the girls' age on the line, as well as a, a, a psychologist, helping, helping them to, to hang on, you know? I think that was the one. And <laughs> then I liked, I liked when we went to Paris. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was really fun. And those girls were so, all they wanted was uh, McDonald's. <laughs> And they, except for Nancy. Nancy, she liked, she liked the, uh, the wonderful French food. Yeah. And uh, it was wonderful. In, and we had a wonderful time in Paris. Thank you for your Thank question. Thank you. We have one more question here. Hi, my name is Mike. Um, I didn't know that you and Cloris Leachman were roommates back in the day. So I was just wondering, where did you have any uh, say in when she came into the show and took over for you? And what did you think of her performance and her role? Well, I think she's such a wonderful artist. I mean, she won an Academy Award many years ago. She's a very, and she's funny. She's brilliant. I thought she was wonderful. And I was glad that she took over for uh, Mrs. Garrett. Yeah. And you know, you know, a lot of boys, I can't tell you. I did a, uh, uh, a book signing at uh, Barnes & Noble. I cannot tell you the number of boys who grew up with uh, Mrs. Garrett, and they all wanted a hug. They came uh, for the book signing. And so it's nice to know it wasn't just the girls. It was the boys who grew up with me. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. We have one more question on this side. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lindy McLoin, and it's nice to meet you too. Uh, that's your son, and uh, right? And how many other children do you have? It was uh, my oldest son, Andy, who died, the one I was reading about. The one who was, um, what's the word, challenged, Andy, you know? And this is my son who works in South Central. What's the name of your school? Uh, uh, middle College High School. Middle College High School. He teaches English. And he really cares about those kids. Helps them write up their uh, things, hoping to get scholarships for them and uh, to move on with their lives, you know. Yeah. That's very interesting. I can learn a lot about that. So is that your first or last son? Um, I'm, oh, I'll end. I'm, I'm the younger son. <laughs> and um, my older brother was uh, um, a Andy, and he, uh, he passed away in 1999. Thank you. We have one last question from this young man right here. Hello. Um, my name is Mason, and I just wanted to ask um, how do you like working on TV shows? Well, how do you like working on TV shows? Well, I like it. It's 
it's wonderful it's hard work and sometimes it can be stressful because when you uh, rehearse you don't get too much rehearsal and you have to go home and drill yourself and then in the you do and get your family to cue you yeah get your family or to anyone queue. else who comes to visit you and you know two two shows you do one you do and then you have uh, dinner and they give you changes of the lines and then you go the next show and you do it and so a lot of people say ah ah you know theater actors I can't do that so but you know it's wonderful it's a wonderful way to make a living if you have the talent for it okay thank you um, Thank you, Vincent. I just I just want to add because um, in the introduction that uh, I just want to correct in the introduction, Charlotte is actually going to be in a production of Endgame, and it's not at the Geffen; it's at the Douglas Theater. And previews start. Well, wait. Like it's at the Kirk Douglas Theater in Culver City. It's by Samuel Beckett. And she she's actually performs the entire play inside of a trash can, which will be very <laughs> interesting. Yeah, um, and uh, and it starts uh, later this month. Yeah, I mean it opens on May first, and there's a week before of previews. Of previews. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you, thank you all very much for coming, and um, and thank oh. you. Is it over? It's over. <laughs>